In a bid to stem the panic, China lifts the 7% circuit breaker as the move comes as stocks in Shanghai nosedive once again as trading was halted in just 29 minutes flat. Wall Street fair some of the losses after a massive gap down opening. European markets also cut some of the losses. Equities across the world are still struggling to stay afloat. There's simply no place to hide on the last street. The Sensex tumbles below 25,000 to hit its lowest level in 52 weeks. The Nifty cracks over 2%. Mid caps are also battered out of shape. Crude oil prices continue to collapse as the OPEC basket drops below $30 a barrel for the first time in 12 years. Brent falls below $33 a barrel for the first time since 2004. China did the right thing and its own share uh, in the world market's merchandise export mm. rose from 2.3% in 1992 to today more than 12%. Mm. That is what we need to do. India should bank on exports and manufacturing for high growth, says the Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog, Arvind Panagaria, also calls for appropriate currency management to protect our exports. For a new family, they will get some equal share uh. of bifurcation results. Uh. Today, I didn't get that also. Building a new capital and making the state drought-free are the top priorities for the Andhra Pradesh Chief Minister Chandrababu Naidu. Also, he hopes to make the state number one in India by 2029. That's the CNBC TV exclusive. Sipla's top tech gets a makeover. CEO Subhanu Saxena will lead a five-member management council to herald a transformation. This even as Serum's Adar Punawala rules out a merger with Sipla in the near term, but holds out hope for the future. In a bid to break the GST deadlock, Parliamentary Affairs Minister Benka and I do meet with Sonia Gandhi, hopes to get all parties on board for an early budget session. The Congress stands firm on its GST demands. Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister Mufti Mohammad Sayyid passes away in Delhi at the age of 79. His daughter Mehbooba Mufti likely to succeed him. There's your open there, and even Hang Seng is being locked by 200 points now as we speak. The Yuan, the RMB, is really putting a lot of pressure to markets. Just want to bring your attention to the slipping markets here. Oh, the CSI no. 300 now is now down 3 percent. The CSI 300 is down more than 5 percent, as you can see, 3,349. Uh, that has frozen. Now we got the Shenzhen markets uh, basically falling through 2,000, down 6.7 percent any minute now. Uh, 55 or 56, uh, it should be coming okay. back into action. We're at 6.3 percent now. Uh -huh. Oh, there goes Shanghai. They, they, they see. They heard. They're watching CNBC. It oh, might happen oh, before 10 o'clock. Look at look at how it's going. All right, there we yeah, go. Okay. All right. Oh, God. It's a national holiday. 29 minutes, 7% wiped out and the world rattled. China marks its shortest stock market session in history as trading was suspended for the second time in four days. But now the securities regulator in China has lifted the circuit breakers. What will it mean when the markets open for trade tomorrow? Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. That is the big story we're tracking. Let's go straight to Yunus Yun in Hong Kong. Yunus, the regulator has suspended the circuit breaker. Can this bring stability or any semblance of stability tomorrow? Well, it's going to be difficult to say, but there's definitely more of a sense of relief in the market. Uh, all day today, individual investors were calling for an end to the circuit breaker system. Uh, the circuit breaker system is triggered uh, first at when you see 5% declines, there's a 15-minute break, and then the selling resume or the, the uh, trading resumes. But in China's case, over the past couple of weeks, that has meant that it immediately drops to by 7% and the whole market closed. So what people here have been saying is that China's stock market is a very volatile market. That over the course of the past year, it was very common to see 5% drops or 5% uh, rallies or 7% rallies. And so they're saying that this circuit breaker system is not suited for China. Well, they finally got their answer. Late tonight, uh, the Chinese uh, government and the authorities had decided that they were going to do away with the circuit breaker system. And online, uh, ahead of time, there were um, there's an interesting poll where 
where more than 86% of the people uh, polled thought that the circuit breakers were not reasonable for this market. So uh, in the, in the uh, uh, chat rooms tonight, in the investor chat rooms, uh, people have been circulating this news, saying that they're feeling relieved about it, but it hasn't yet spread online, and that's probably because it's quite late tonight, though tomorrow the CSRC or the Chinese regulator is going to be holding a regular weekly briefing at 4 p.m. local time, which is when the market or after the market closes, and so most uh, we can expect to hear more from the regulator on the reasoning behind this decision. Over to you. All right, Eunice Yoon, appreciate you joining us. We're keeping you up late tonight, Eunice, but thanks very much for joining us. The Chinese regulator lifting the circuit breaker. Will this alleviate some of the panic or not? That's the big question. Most people seem to suggest that yes, it will. Now, China lifting that circuit breaker will have a positive impact on markets across the world. That's the word in from Robert Parker of Credit Suisse. However, he also cautions that market fundamentals continue to remain weak. But at this point in time, global markets, the U.S. markets have come off their intraday lows. Let's listen into Robert Parker and then we'll do a market check. Probably the, uh, that 7% limit actually was a source of volatility. Um, and I would also argue it may have been a source um, of selling pressure. Um, so consequently, I think the removal of that 7% probably is going to be a positive factor. Now, having said that, you know, we can't ignore the fundamentals. Now, we started this week with a very weak uh, Kaishin Manufacturing PMI Index. Um, and that set the tone for the week for a downward move in commodity prices and uh, this global equity market sell-off. So, you know, one can't just look at the technical factors on how the market is managed. One also has to look at the fundamentals, and the fundamentals are that the Chinese economy continues to slow down. Well, that's Robert Parker there talking about how the circuit breaker may have in fact exacerbated the volatility and the panic. Wall Street, as I pointed out, managing to come off its intraday lows, but it's still trading with deep cuts. The Dow's still down by about triple digits. Uh, that's the Dow down 145 points. The S&P 500 has lost about a percent, and the Nasdaq is down by a percent and a half at this point in time. And the European markets, Nantara, how have they closed for the day? Well, let's bring up the frontline indices for you. Like we started by telling you in the show, we did see some of the losses being paired towards the end here. The British would see closing down by 112 points. Look at the German DAX going home down by 230 points. The French CAC, nothing great to talk about there either, down by 70 points. So you have that because of the Chinese economy, the turmoil that you saw in the stock markets, but also because of lower crude prices. They fell by nearly two years, 12 year low today. And the fall in the market is like 2008 all over again. That's the word that's coming from the billionaire investor George Soros. Speaking of an event in Sri Lanka, Soros said the current environment reminded him of the crisis that we had seen in 2008. Soros added, China has a major adjustment problem and that could lead to a major global crisis. Well, that's the word coming in from George Soros. Now, it's the worst start of the new year in recent memory. Stocks in Shanghai down like nine pins, rattling equities across the world back home. The Sensex hit its lowest level in 52 weeks during intraday trade. 25,000 is gone and 2% was wiped out. The Nifty is not far away from its 52-week low. Both the major indices ending the day at their lowest closing levels in four months. The mid-caps also waxed out of shape with the mid-cap index losing nearly 3%. Now the markets have lost nearly 5% in just the first five trading sessions of two. 2016. What an awful start. Anuj and Lata join us now from the market desk with their analysis. Anuj, to you first, it's getting uglier by the day and there's simply no place to hide at this point in time or so it seems. We've been calling it the fear factor for a reason. There's fear in the market, and that's something which is visible. Markets don't fall 5% in five days uh, unless there's the fear factor, and that's what's happening right now. There's panic factor across most of the equity markets, led by China, of course. But China alone is not the worry, as I pointed out earlier. The German DAX is cracking 4% on a daily basis almost. So every day we are seeing Dow futures down 300 points while we are trading. Nikkei is down 3 to 4% almost uh, on a daily basis, so uh, or at least two or three times uh, per, per this, this year. So that's clearly making a lot of people nervous, and that's what you saw in trade today. In fact, the Sensex hit a 52-week low. The Nifty is practically there. So both Sensex and Nifty 
are almost at 52 week lows. Uh, a lot of individual stocks are at 52 week lows. When index stocks, so many of them and so many of the, these heavyweights start to make 52 week lows, you know that the market has a problem. Larsen and Tubro is at 52 week low. ICICI Bank is at 52 week low. Axis is at 52 week low. SBI is at 52 week low. I, ITC is almost getting there. It's only Reliance and HDFC Bank that's, you know, who are trying to bat for the bulls. Uh, otherwise, if you look at the metal stocks, you know, Vedanta, Hindalco, other commodity stocks like cane. So there's quite a bit of decline. But one internal that broke the bulls back today was clearly the advanced decline ratio. Because even on Monday when the market was down this much, the advanced decline ratio was 1 is to 2. Today we had advanced decline ratio 1 is to 9. And we had cash market volume surging. The market had been warning for the last 2 or 3 days that a lot of mid caps traders have overstayed their welcome and that warning clearly was something that a lot of traders would not have heeded to but today you saw the impact of that cash market volume surge and you saw a big decline in the, in the markets in the mid caps. The market is oversold, make no mistake about that but the market can remain oversold for a long period of time. If the US market and DAX can fall like this, what are we? We are at the end of the day a high beta stock uh, but at the same point uh, you know, in my conversation with a lot of people, the sense I get is that maybe we are now approaching a time where some bit of bargain hunting could be there over the next few days. The question is, when do we see the bargain hunting start? But Anuj, uh, you know, let's go across to Lata now. Lata, what's happening as far as Yuan is concerned? We've seen further devaluation. What is this going to mean now as far as global markets are concerned, global currencies are concerned? Well, uh, it's the official Chinese uh, devaluation that is worrying. Uh, that was moving, it moved violently in August, if you remember. And then it was a very slow depreciation, uh, largely 0 0.1, 0 0.05 a day. But this week it has been 0.2% in the first two or three trading days. And today it was 056 and the, on, the offshore yuan, which is more freely traded than NMB, is actually widened, moved more far, uh, far, far apart. It has depreciated more than the official yuan. And now the depreciation from August levels is as high as 8.5%. Possibly today the Chinese uh, authorities intervened in that market as well. That's the talk. Now, what is worrisome? Uh, see, the Chinese yuan was pegged to the dollar. Chances are now with the dollar appreciating and China not doing as well, they want to unpeg and they want to peg it to a basket of currencies. So while against dollar it looks seriously depreciated, they are probably moving in step with a basket of currencies. This is probably a communication problem. The other issue could be they also want the yuan to get more uh, market determined. These explanations will not worry the market. What worries the market is, does the PBOC know something about China which the rest of the world doesn't know? That is what is rattling the market. And I'll tell you why that fear comes, because if you notice the markets fell about 2 o'clock or 2.30, that is when the FX data from China came out. And that showed that $107 billion of FX reserves had been expended in December. For all of 2015, uh, $512 billion had been expended. The reserves... The famous Chinese reserves of three and a half billion, four, sorry, three and a half trillion, four trillion is now down to 3.33 trillion. So there's not much back. You know, in India, we say that we should have at least eight month imports, nine month imports. In China, that comparable figure is actually three trillion. So, you know, you're very, you're very close to your threshold. There are some people who fear that therefore that big Chinese threshold is not really there. And if it really is, you know, 250 uh, percent of debt to GDP that uh, uh, Chinese bank have and if much of them are getting rotten then there is not so much of a backstop that they have uh, in terms of being able to mend various parts of the economy so China may move slow faster and may land harder than what most people thought it is this that is driving the fear factor separately of course this is being accompanied by crude falling for its own supply demand di uh, uh, dynamics uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Saudi and Iran are probably trying to make each other poorer and thereby uh, impoverishing uh, anyone who produces oil so that is a separate fear factor that might uh, uh, render a lot of funds uh, out of pocket and uh, see redemptions the third factor that we should note in the entire space is that India will be the last one to sink 
the rupee actually is usually strong in the Jan March quarter because that's when exporters uh, bring back their money. As well, we just had that auction of FII limits. So actually, dollars came in today. My guess is that the RBI did not support the rupee today. The rupee supported itself, which means it's really an outstandingly stable currency uh, at this point in time. So while we should worry about stock market reverses, the only point we don't have to worry about, perhaps or the last thing we should worry about, is the Indian rupee. That's the silver lining. Uh, we don't have to worry about the rupee depreciating too much. Thanks, Lata, for joining us with that analysis. You just heard Lata talking about crude. Let's discuss that a lot more now. A barrel of crude is cheaper than a bottle of champagne. Crude. Unfortunately, you can't <laughs> drink it, Netha. <laughs> or buy it. You really can't go buy a barrel of crude. So crude prices have touched a new 12-year low today, trading below the $33 to a barrel mark. The OPEC basket has slipped below $30 for the first time since 2004. All of that spooking investors. We have seen flight of capital from the uh, crude market towards gold. Question now is our crude price is going to head even lower? Listen it. Close to the bottom. We, uh, I, was a, I was just a year off. <laughs> they uh, will be back up 70, 75 by the end of the year. Today, the world's using about 95 million barrels a day. And we're oversupplied by a million barrels. So you're, it's not going to take much to, uh, to balance the market. Well, sub-30 is uh, a definite conceivable reality. Uh, the 2004 low uh, for Brent was around $28 a barrel. And that, that again, it's, it's conceivable to see. We still continue to put oil in storage. We still can continue to have inventory concerns. And that refinery maintenance I alluded to earlier is going to become a worry, especially if Iran comes back to the market in the March-April time. So sub-30 is a conceivable reality uh, for crude markets. Uh, however, it's very unlikely that you're going to stay there for any sustained period of time. Markers uh, tend to have a, uh, a, a tendency to overreact to uh, a news, you know, going below a 30 to uh, a 20. Could happen, but uh, I, I doubt that uh, if we got uh, to the $20 level, it would stay there uh, uh, for long. But uh, there's right. no question prices will uh, likely stay low at these levels in the coming weeks and uh, maybe throughout uh, the uh, first quarter of this year. So it's unanimous, crude prices will stay low, but opinion divided on how low they will touch. So crude getting clobbered, equities are getting battered. Is gold now the new safe haven? International gold prices did hit the highest level in over two months earlier in the trade today. Let's bring up the gold price for you. That's the MCX price for you on your screen. Well, this is not the beginning of a bear market. That's the word from City's top India strategist and managing director, Aditya Narayan. The market veteran was the CNBC TV18 guest editor through the day. And despite all the gloom and doom around, Narayan is still betting on a 20% return from the market this year. Take a look at the CNBC TV18 exclusive. <laughs> It may not be a bear market, but the volatility is real and it's here to stay. That's how City is reading the current collapse in markets around the world, including India. China is at the epicenter and City's India MD Aditya Narayan feels the economic adjustment that the world's second largest economy is going through could lead to some more volatility. So, to some extent, we've been a little cautious on the currency. We've seen a certain amount of downside there. We didn't think it would come in such a jerky manner. Uh, in fact, our initial read was that it would all happen then and you know, after that we, we thought it, it would stretch out a bit. But yes, it's tended to be very jerky in the, in, in, in the immediate uh, term. Uh, but we do see a certain amount of weakness uh, you know, on the yuan. So does this mean more pain for India? Not necessarily, says Narayan. He cites a number of factors. To begin with, the fact that domestic investors have provided plenty of support to the market at a time when foreign investors have turned away. I think the big change really is that the base has flipped. The second bit is a lot of the domestic money that has actually come in over the last 6 to 12 months has actually not done as badly as the top-down sense is. 
uh, a lot of the market has actually done well. A lot of the smaller and mid caps have done even better, which is where, where a lot of this money is is going in. Another positive is the tempering of earnings expectations. At most numbers, if you see for the market for FY17 range between 18 to 20 percent for the Sensex, but there is actually a kind of a presumption that these numbers will effectively get cut, mm. and I think that's a that's a nice position to be in. Because that's why City is expecting a 20% return from the market this year. The brokerage's December 2016 target stands at 32,000 based on 16 times one-year forward earnings. It's optimistic on financials, autos, energy, cement, utilities and pharma stocks. But Narayan points to one vulnerability. The commodity fall advantage, he feels, could have run its course and may just start working against market returns if prices continue to crash. That you already have a banking sector that's kind of pushed to the wall uh, and these added stresses, you know, start building up a little bit. So, in some senses, while there will always be arguments for, you know, for the weakness in commodities helping the big picture India, I think you've reached a situation where the dislocation because of these drops is now big, beginning to actually hurt. Despite the challenges, City maintains a positive view in the current downtrend. Narayan, however, adds that 2016 will be a stock picker's year. He says this won't be an easy market where you can ride one big thematic wave, but one in which investors will have to work with multiple themes and stories in specific stocks and sectors to pocket smart returns. Bureau Report, CNBC TV 18. Well, a stock picker's market it certainly is going to be. Time now for another CNBC TV 18 exclusive. India needs to act fast and work towards boosting exports. That's the message coming in from the Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog, Arvind Panagaria. Speaking to me earlier today, he said India needs to focus more on its internal dynamics rather than wait for global factors to turn favorable. Listen in. I think uh, in view of the numbers that we have had for the first two quarters of the current fiscal year, uh, perhaps, you know, getting to 8% for the entire year might be difficult. Uh, although even that cannot be ruled out because some of these uh, uh, growth uh, estimates get revised later on. Mm. So we could yet see some upward revision. Uh, but uh, I still remain optimistic that, you know, at least for the fourth quarter that when we get there, we would be touching 8%. If I could ask you to comment on, on what we're seeing happen as far as global factors are concerned. China is the big dragon in the room, so to speak, and we're seeing how the Chinese stock markets are reacting practically every other day to the news that's coming in from China. Uh, that is worrying global markets uh, at this point in time, including ours. How concerned are you about the impact of the slowdown in China on global growth? Our exports have been declining for 10 straight months. What will it mean then for India? To me, uh, at the end of the day, uh, global economy is uh, whether or not or how fast global economy grows is less important. What is much more important is what we do here at home. Let me explain. Now, China grew from 1995 onwards, or even before that actually, but at 10% China has been growing for the last three decades. Take the figures from 1995 to 2013 for OECD growth. Mm. Only 1.4%. It's not as if China grew because OECD countries were growing very rapidly. It was because China did the right things. And its own share uh, in the world market's merchandise export mm. rose from 2.3% in 1992 to today more than 12%. Mm. That is what we need to do. Okay. Do the right things so that we acquire today our share in the world exports is only 1.75%. Mm. This is on merchandise exports. Mm. Services we have a little bit more. Mm. Uh, take this to 6% in the next 5 to 6 years. I think that's what we need to do. Also a quick comment on the recent UN devaluation and what that will mean as far as Indian exports are concerned. Yeah. No, I think this does. Obviously, if, if, if yuan depreciates and uh, therefore we relative to yuan appreciates, it does impact our ability to export to the markets where we are actually competing with China. Mm. It's not only uh, relevant for the Chinese market, but it's also relevant for the third markets where we are competing against China. So it certainly matters. And in that context, clearly, you know, part of the reason our exports are doing uh, not quite very well uh, is that rupee actually, uh, uh, though it may not have appreciated 
a whole lot against the dollar, mm -hmm. against a lot of the other currencies, mm -hmm. uh, it has appreciated in real terms particularly. Let me then ask you as far as uh, you know, the next big economic event and that uh, a lot of people believe could be the next trigger as far as trying to jumpstart growth uh, in the domestic market and that is the budget. The consultation process has now started. Uh, uh, what can the contribution be as far as the Niti Aayog is concerned from the budget perspective? I know that the Prime Minister has set up uh, groups to look into what could be the possible ways that we could see recommendations being implemented in the budget. What are the timelines that we're looking at and what is the emphasis or the slant of what the Prime Minister's ask is? Right. So now I think Prime Minister is quite open. Uh, and, and his purpose in uh, 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 constituting these groups has been uh, to get the ideas for big changes uh, that uh, may possibly be made. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what the groups themselves come back and report. Mm -hmm. Niti Aayog's uh, uh, contribution, of course, uh, is uh, continuously there. Uh, uh, as the, the Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog, I sit on most of these meetings, uh, where uh, uh, expertise uh, uh, in specific areas exists in, within Niti Aayog. We have a, uh, members uh, who specialize in social sectors, members who specialize in agriculture. There again, if there are issues related to that uh, uh, that are being discussed at meetings with the Prime Minister, uh, the members go and sit there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we very actively participate in this. What would you like to see in the budget? What should be the emphasis of this budget? Uh, at the end of the day, I think we just discussed and, and I firmly believe that uh, in the end, the large markets are outside. These are the export markets. Uh, we tend to focus more on the domestic market, so these are relatively small. We take electronics industry, our domestic market is 65 billion, the global market is 2 trillion plus. Uh, that is where we need to set our eyes. So the budget 2016 should focus on incentivizing exports, 18 straight months of export decline. What are we going to see as far as the strategy is concerned? That's the big question. Now speaking of the Niti Aayog, the current DIPP Secretary Amitabh Kant has been appointed as the new CEO of the Niti Aayog. He will take over from Sindhu Shri Khuller as the CEO of the Niti Aayog. DK Sikri, a Gujarat Kada officer, has been appointed as the new chairman of the competition watchdog. Remember CNBC TV 18 was the first to report that Sikri was in the running to succeed Ashok Chavla. He will take over from Ashok Chavla as the CCI chairman tomorrow. Amitabh Kant was the front runner for the CCI but as we reported the government was in a dilemma. One camp believed that he should be uh, at Niti Aayog to try and give the institution some muscle but uh, the other camp believed that he would work well as a regulator but Niti Aayog it is for Kant and DK Sikri takes over as the CCI chairman. And there. But she now to politics and parliament in a bit to break the deadlock over the GST. The Parliamentary Affairs Minister Venka and I do today met with Sonia Gandhi at her residence. Naidu said he's offered to advance the budget session of parliament provided the opposition agrees to play ball in passing key legislation. The Congress party, however, seems unimpressed. Kapil Sibyl has said, Venka and Naidu's meeting with Sonia Gandhi on GST is mere optics and there is no written proposal from the government. Sonia Ji ko aur Manmohan Singh Ji ko bulaya aur ham logo ne GST aur anya jo kanuno ke baare mein chacha kiya. Usi silsile mein mai aaj aake Parliament Affairs Minister ke aake mai Congress Adhyaksha Sonia Ji se mila aur unko yaad dilaya last time jo discuss hua uske hisab se Congress Party apna stand try karna chahiye. उन्होंने कुछ इश्यूज रेस किया उस समय उस इश्यूज का वित्त मंत्री ने जवाब दे दिया बिंकाया जी मिसेस गांधी को मिलने गए और हमारी पोजीशन जीएसटी पे बड़ी क्लियर है एंड दिस इन फैक्ट इवन अरुण जेटली हैज एग्रीड विद अस ऑन दैट दैट इट इज बेटर नॉट टू हैव अ जीएसटी देन अ फ्लॉट जीएसटी so in a nutshell, the deadlock continues over the GST. Budget pre preparations are on in full swing. Today was the turn of tech companies to submit their wish list to Arun Jaitley. High on the list of demands is the deferment of the sunset clause proposed for the current IT exemptions that were granted to companies operating out of SEZs. Hardware manufacturers on their part want the government to stick to differential rate structure for equipment imports in budget 2016. What we presented is 
is the duty differential which the government bought about last uh, uh, last year uh, has really recreated this, in this industry. You have about uh, 30,000 jobs which have been created or recreated uh, back in the market with uh, many people including Foxconn uh, starting manufacturing operations. In the face of uh, a barrage of protectionist measures which are coming up across the world in different countries and coming up uh, especially in countries uh, which have been advocating uh, more liberalization uh, in India, more liberalization of trade, more liberalization of investment and uh, with uh, whom there are uh, efforts to increase the level of trade uh, that we should be very care careful about remaining competitive that's the wish list of the IT sector. It's not just the finance minister, his counterpart in the commerce ministry, Nirmala Sitharaman, today met with business leaders in the capital. That's, of course, the day after Arun Jaitley met India Inc. Improving imports, increasing FDI investments, concerns over foreign trade agreements or FTAs were some of the top issues that were discussed, as was FDI in multi brand retail. Concerns about FTAs and their impact on uh, Indian industry and commerce. Uh, looking at uh, as and when there is a review of FTAs, what are the kind of things we could do, but that we didn't get into greater details, but that was flagged off as an issue. So, day after meeting with the finance minister, chambers take their course to Nirmala Sitaraman.